All right, uh, recording started. The stage is yours, Martin. I'm just sharing that. I think I'm just going to share it this way here. You see the screen? Good. Uh, yes, yes, we can see the screen. Martin. All right. Thank you very much. So this session here uh, will be around do's and don'ts with tiering of cloud and AD. So I will be covering one of Microsoft's uh, identity models called Enterprise Access Model. So. The reason why we're here, so this is kind of the why you can say is because we're going to talk about delegation and we, you know, the what we actually aim for is, of course, the better security and um, and why we need to to talk about delegation inside cloud is because cloud is kind of a monster when it comes to, you know, the number of roles that we can have inside cloud. So the ones that are used to or comes from an Active Directory, or I would refer to as a legacy Active Directory, are having uh, mostly four different roles, like domain admins, enterprise uh, admins, um, local admins, and, and a user. Basically, that's it. But when we go into the cloud, we have six, 700 uh, roles. So we need to have a framework where, where we can ensure that we have <clears throat> the least <clears throat> amount of privilege. Um, and we also need to have a framework that can scale to multiple clouds. So this is very important. So we, we don't want to have separate models when it comes to the different clouds that are out there. And so we need to have a framework for that. And the other thing which is important here is that we want to move from a permanent allocation of permissions to a more time-based uh, permission. So, in in other words, because I can to just enough, just in time. So that is what this session here is all about. My name is Morten Knudsen, and uh, I'm ex I'm one. Of, I'm working with Microsoft, as you can see, and I'm a big fan of it. Um, I'm a uh, Microsoft MVP in security, and I was actually in India back in May. Uh, so maybe some of you met me there while I was there, hoping to come. Uh, again, uh, soon, uh, um, I have submitted sessions for Experts Live India, so I'm crossing my fingers to, to meet you guys there if you are uh, around. Um, I'm also an Azure Hybrid MVP. So, and lastly, I'm also an Experts Live organizer in Denmark. So, so what we're going to talk about here today is we're going to talk about what is Microsoft RAMP, and then access uh, enterprise access uh, model and look about design principles. You're going to see some samples of this. And then I have also uh, made some add-ons to PIM that I wanted to show you that uh, maybe you can find interest in. The session here is actually targeted two types of audience. So I know maybe some of you are new to PIM or delegation within uh, using PIM, and I hope that you will see some into get some introduction and inspiration around this topic here. And I know some of you are also experts in this field, and maybe you want to see some more detailed examples of how to do this and 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 take it to the next level. Um, so and this page, this presentation here, here's the QR code for this presentation. So Actually, this presentation has a lot more slides uh, into it. So I have a lot of hidden pages inside this presentation here. So if you grab your phone and scan this QR code, you should be able to download the complete presentation. And everything that you're gonna see today, including the demos and everything are included in this presentation. So 
you can download the presentation and you can share it with your colleagues, uh, your friends, your mom, whatever you want, and 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 see it afterwards. And there are also more details uh, around, uh, for example, RAMP, and more samples of namings and how to set up PIM for AED and stuff. So grab that. <clears throat> so to set the scene here, uh, what we need to have in order for us to uh, roll out a best practice around how to fastly uh, lock down our environment and introduce these different um, frameworks is a kind of a, a model. And Microsoft has a model called Rapid Modernization Plan uh, or RAMP in daily terms. So keep that uh, you know, uh, acronym in mind if you are here for the quiz later on, because that might be a question around what the acronym is. So, so what we're going to talk about today is around how we can manage privilege accounts, and uh, more specifically uh, focusing on the PIM side. But inside the ramp, we also touch on uh, topics like monitoring of AD uh, using MDI or Defender for Identity. We're also touching about how we can improve credential management. We also touch about how we can, you know, protect uh, the privilege sessions. So more more focus on the the workstations that we use to jump for from uh, to manage and do, uh, you know, high privilege management of our environment. Uh, we want to protect those machines so that so that we enforce that. We can only do it from a certain machines with a certain lockdown. So we're not going to touch around this because all these topics by itself are uh, a full session. So we're going to zoom in on this particular one here, where, which I talked about, where we're going to focus around how can we separate things, what around tiering, how can we enable the PIM management, and how can we categorize them, uh, groups and stuff like that. So to set the scene here, in the left corner here, you will see what many of you probably have been working on for the last couple of years around tiering inside uh, legacy Active Directory environments. So uh, where we had a tier zero, which is typically uh, the uh, servers that are uh, dealing with identities or having uh, high privilege access to our Active Directory. Those are the ones that we want to protect uh, the most. And in tier one, we have typically uh, the rest of the servers and in tier two, we have our workstations uh, typically. So enterprise access model kind of replaces this. So think of this model as now we want to have a model which can span both our on-prem environment our Active Directory, or, or sorry, our Entra ID, our AWS, uh, and all our different clouds uh, out there. And we do that by introducing some words. So you're going to learn about today uh, some planes, control plane, management plane, data workflow plane, and, and user access. Um, so these are the types of words that we use and we're going to drill into this. So again, enterprise access model is kind of version two of the um, legacy um, uh, tiering model that we might have been using uh, for AD. So now it spans multiple cloud access. So why is it that we need to have a framework? So by itself, if we look at Active Directory, uh, uh, Azure AD or Intra AD, as it is called now, uh, inside Intra ID, we have 102 roles today. So again, just by itself, moving from AD to, to Intra ID, we're going from four roles to now 102 roles by itself. And the numbers are increasing. So whenever there's a new product coming out, there will be a a global role uh, attached to it. But in the bottom, you will also see that there are a number of other systems within the infrastructure, like Intune, Exchange, and it could be other cloud applications. And we also have the whole Azure resource level, um, which also has its own RBAC. And if you just zoom in on Azure RBAC by itself, 
When I last checked, it had 427 different roles. 427 different roles. So again, if you just look at this page here, we need we are looking at more than 600 different roles, and that's why this is a monster. <clears throat> here are some examples of some of these uh, uh, RBAC uh, roles. Uh, so for example, this is for the, uh, the Unified Defender RBAC, where we can now in the middle here, you can see security operations, security posture, authorization, and settings. So these are some uh, built-in roles that we can give access to, to a group, and then it will automatically reflect on all the different products within the Defender portal. Um, uh, as you can see here, we can also customize things here on the right. This is another example so within Intune. So again, we don't need all of our admins to be into administrator. We can actually lock down the uh, permissions uh, even uh, further uh, and delegate more specific rights uh, here on the on the in the right corner. Uh, in particular, I think there are eleven or something like that uh, roles uh, inside uh, Intune. This is Exchange, where we have more than twenty different roles inside their RBAC that we also need to have in control for. So, and there are a lot more different products like Power Platform, Power Platform DevOps, Dynamics, and, and all these have different RBACs inside their, um, inside their security model that we need to deal with. And you're gonna see some examples of how to, to do this um, during this presentation here. So now, I have added a more, uh, some more things on the slide here. So here we actually will see that we now have the tiering, uh, uh, you know, added to this slide. So what you will see in the very top is the control plane, which is the tier zero resources. And this is kind of when you have tier, tier zero uh, permissions, you are kind of guard to this because you are having the highest privilege in the environment and you can uh, manage uh, everything. And what you can see here is actually conditional access is up here on the, on the left corner. And that is actually also a tier zero resource. So we don't want everyone uh, in the company to be able to manage our identity uh, platform around the security. Uh, and so that is a, a lockdown uh, privilege that is needed uh, to do that. If you look here on the left corner, you will see the tenant root, which is kind of, is it a tier zero or is it tier one? Um, it seems like Microsoft is not, uh, you know, in in particular here around it. Um, I I would say it's a it's a tier a zero, but but again, you decide on your own how you see it. So moving down into the tier one, what we have here is that we have some different uh, resources and we have some different names. What you can see here with the blue is the management plane. So think of the management plane as if you are in working on the, for example, on the connectivity or the identity or the logging or the Sentinel, you are working inside the management plane. And the management plane kind of goes crosswide uh, your entire landing zone infrastructure. So it needs to have, uh, you need to have specific permissions in order for being able to manage that and, and apply a configuration down towards this. You will also see over here, you have the work workload plane, which is where we have our applications. You will also see me referring this to as the data or workload slash data plane. So you'll see an acronym like WDP for workload data plane, because I have also seen lots of examples of landing zones with the purpose of just sharing data. So I'm not using the word workload for that. I'm kind of using the data for that. 
So, but it's all located inside the Azure resource uh, structure here. So, um, so that's why uh, it's the workload data plane, and we need to have permission for that. On the right side here, you will see user access, and you will right as you will soon see that the the user access or the tier two access can actually be split into two different categories. One category is the user, which is having um, access to resources, and a user in that context can be, you know, externals also, or, or regular users, but it can also be an app having access, where we maybe have an app which is delegated permission to upload um, something in uh, in, into a storage account, or it can read some data. So that is also considered as a tier two uh, access uh, in this context. So when we bring this slide down into a table form, we will see now that we have, um, instead of having three tiers that we had in the old model, we actually now still have the three tiers, but it's, it is, if we want to be more specific, we have five different ways to categorize our tiering. So we have the control plane, the workload data plane, our management plane, and in the tier two, we have the app and the user access. So those are the ones that, that we need to deal with. So when we want to design, um, a solution, design our, our security model, um, we use some components within the intra infrastructure uh, to do that. And first of all, we will do um, we will need to use, of course, groups within intra ID. And we're going to see some examples of namings. We have our admins. We have the PIM infrastructure. We have uh, the administrative units, and we have the access reviews. And we're going to see those uh, today. So. If you don't know the administrative units, what that does for you, think of it this way. If you, if you know the old legacy AD environment, I would refer to this as similar to an organization unit or an OU. So uh, it is very important to use AUs uh, or administrative units within the, um, in, inside the cloud environment, because if, if you don't use that, then everyone with, for example, the permission group administrator can take and put himself into a group which are being delegated, for example, global admin permissions. Or if I have like password uh, uh, management uh, permissions, then I can reset the password of the uh, global admin. So. That's why we are using AU. So we structure our users and we structure our devices uh, into these containers. And then if we go down uh, to, for example, this is an example where we can see I have um, a, a scope called users in Denmark, users in EU or in the US, and then my help desk are being delegated permission to reset password or to do groups administration um, on this um, AU. And that means that they can only manage password and groups on this particular set of users that are in this and not the entire scope of my intro ID. Um, so that is the main reason for uh, structuring our users and devices and our groups into AUs is to lock down these global permissions, uh, uh, high privilege uh, permissions. Um, and, and that's the reason for doing that. <clears throat> so now we're moving into some, I would refer to as design principles. And this is of course, where you guys can do what you want. Uh, this is uh, where there's uh, of course some guidance around this, but this is where your organization, your structure, your you know, ge geographic structure, You're, are you centralized IT, are you decentralized IT, and um, how are you structured? This is where we, that we 
we cannot roll out a full model that fits everything, but we have some principles, and that's what I'm going to touch on now. So again, what you'll see here is what works for me, but use whatever works for you, um, and, and hopefully you will get inspired by this. How I do it is when I target my delegations, and again, this is important because when we are talking about delegations and PIM, we are not just focusing on the administrator. So it's not just for delegation for the IT team. It's actually also for delegations for end users. So I have customers today that want to delegate um, using PIM uh, permission, for example, to Power BI resources. So when they have to do certain things within Power BI, they have to, you know, uh, activate an eligible permissions uh, in order for them to do that. So if you have an E5 license, you will have, uh, you will, you'll be good and and be ready to do this. So again, this is not just for IT. This is also for um, for the end users. I'm working with the PIM team in Seattle to actually see if we can do this even better for end users. So one of the things that I have requested for them is a way for us to, to um, present like an alias instead of presenting groups and, 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 and that would make things even easier for an end user. So it would say, for example, HR system, instead of just showing a group, that maybe the IT people understands, but for an end user, it can be tough for them to decrypt what we ever we think is uh, is easy for us to understand. So again, <clears throat> when we are targeting or delegating, I'm using departments, roles, service, task, resource, and process as a way for me to differentiate uh, my permissions <clears throat> and. And you're gonna see this. Uh, it, it, uh, you're gonna see a, a, another slide of that uh, soon, where you can see how I do with this. Again, at the department is where I'm typically taking the organization structure within the company and making groups that reflect these organization structure. With, when we're talking about roles, we are talking about typically a more mature organization using words like SecOps, uh, Platform Ops, DevOps, and stuff like that. Whereas less mature companies uh, have a tendency to still using departments uh, of a way to structure their responsibility. We will also see service ac acronyms. Uh, and a service in that sense can be, for example, getting access to Intune, SharePoint, DevOps, Active Directory, Promark, Task can be, I need to have permissions to do compliance reporting, or I need permissions to do cost management. When it comes to resource, now we are going one level down from a service thinking and going more specific into a specific resource, which could be, for example, Promac database reader or Promac server 13 local admin. And a process, lastly, can be I'm responsible for the patch process. So I'm the patch owner of this. Um, again, if we are using the department way of structuring your, um, your infrastructure, we all know that within our IT department, not all are getting the same permissions, even though they're part of the department. Or it could be, well, if you're using the role, uh, not all are getting the same level of permission. So what I've come up with is seven levels of permission. So that's the level zero to six on the left side here. And again, if you think of it, uh, if you are comparing this to uh, the old way with the AD way, then you have the enterprise admins on the top. And the same uh, is the global admin. So an L0 level is the high privilege global role admin. So this is closer to God than, than, than everyone else. Um, and if you go underneath here, 
you have the L1, which is a global role admin. Again, if you think of the slide where I showed 102 roles um, within my um, tenant, I, the L0 is the one, the global, um, the, um, at the admin, global admin, and then the 101 different other roles are the L1 roles are under here. So for example, cloud application administrator is a level one global role admin. And again, if you compare to an AD environment, that would be the domain admins or the DNS administrator. <clears throat> and again, moving on, we have the L2, which is a scoped role admin. And a scope role admin can be, for example, I am an exchange online records management, um, or I am the owner of a subscription or of a, um, a management group. Or if you compare it to an old AD environment, I would be a local administrator on a server or a sysadmin on a SQL server. <clears throat> then moving on, we have the operator level, the support level, the read permission and we have the user permission. So those are the design principles that I use when I design my infrastructure. Again, for example, the support level here, that could be I am being delegated password administrator on the AU scope of called users Denmark or users US, or I am the on the operator level, I am the Sentinel operator. So these are samples of uh, how you can do that. When we look at the accounts that we use, we have separate accounts for everything. We don't sync any accounts from our AD into our cloud and use that account for doing cloud uh, management. We have separate accounts for AD we has, and, and for cloud. And that is what you can see here. The gray ones up here are accounts um, that are used for internal users. In my uh, example here, it is called admin and my initials, tier, tier zero, and ID. An ID in this uh, here means that it is intra ID that are responsible for managing this particular account, whereas when it says AD, that is where AD is responsible for managing this particular account. And you have the tier zero, tier one. And for externals, we have five ways to delegate permissions. You have the same. This is just an example where they are using uh, X dash, uh, uh, showing that it's an external. And you can also do invites, where you invite a person uh, into your tenant, and then you delegate the permission uh, here. But again, again, we don't sync privileged uh, users because if your account is being hacked in the cloud, it will give you uh, them access also for your AD environment. So this uh, slide here is actually showing how, uh, from a very holistic view, I'm doing the design. So look on the right side, you will see all the resources, which are the end target where we want to delegate permission for, like Azure resources, intro roles, Intune, Power Platform, DevOps, Defender, Exchange, and you get it. On the left side, you will see that we have some ways or dimensions, uh, I would call them. So again, we have one dimension, which is the organization, View uh, from uh, from an organization, we have the cross organization view, which is taking that could be like all sales managers or all developers cross uh, departments. Uh, so these are uh, teams or groups or um, um, a, a, a way of us to uh, structure things in a cross organization view. We also have roles, and we typically also use uh, words like projects. So this is kind of a temporary access. I'm, for example, it could be we have a project called New Intranet, um, and we want to delegate permission for that. Uh, and there is like an end of date for projects. 
if you go to the optional, we have tasks and we have processes. So sometimes we want to delegate permissions um, for, again, for tasks. I need uh, the compliance team need permission to be able to read our compliance uh, score uh, from within in our cloud. And in the middle here, this is where we have our groups that we delegate permission to uh, within the PIM infrastructure. And as you can see here, I'm using uh, two types of resources, like the service uh, way, which is when I have access to a service like the Intune service, uh, then that means that I have um, cross-wide, I have access to everything, um, or it could be SharePoint. That means that I have you know, high privilege cross-wide for all uh, SharePoint resources when I have access to a service. Whereas if I go down to a specific resource, that means that I have access to a workspace within my SharePoint, or I have access to a specific server or a storage account or a management group. Um, so that's how I use the difference between a service and a resource uh, in, in my designs. When we're moving on, you can see here some examples of naming conventions. And again, these are examples uh, and pick your choice, but it works for me and, and for my customers, and, and they're really uh, happy about this. Um, as I mentioned, we have the ID and AD. We have the different planes, acronyms at the bottom. And also keep in mind that uh, there are some limitations here uh, that we need to understand. Uh, if you are syncing some of these groups uh, inside AD, <clears throat> and we're going to touch on that, Later on, there's a limit of 63 uh, characters and intro is 256 uh, characters. Um, so um, ensure to, to have a good uh, structure that works uh, here. <clears throat> These are some of the examples of real customers where, or again, it's a simple uh, structure, a, a smaller IT department with 30 people in the IT department. So in this case here, you can see, for example, we have the management, which are being delegated only reader permissions if, because they only need uh, like permissions for, for example, uh, some dashboards, some KPIs. We have the help disk, which is a uh, level four, um, the operation operator, L3, scoped admin, and so on. So these are different uh, examples of departments that we use in our delegation model. This is another example where I'm using the role um, way of showing this in a more mature or a customer where they have organized themselves into more roles like SecOps, Platform Ops, Identity Ops, and so on, where you will see a, a similar uh, structure to this. This is a third example where I'm using the task dimension and you'll actually see here that I'm using some AD related things. So, and you'll probably think, why is he talking about AD within Entry-ID? So this is where I'm gonna show you that I've actually built PIM for AD, and you're gonna see that later on in this presentation here. So the end target for this is actually, you can initiate a PIM session within Entry-ID, and when, once you do that, you are being assigned the permission that will allow you to, for example, do group management uh, or group policy management within your actual directory environment. So you're gonna see that later on. This is an example of a simple design where we on the right side, again, have some Azure resources. On the middle, we have some groups which reflect our landing zones with some permissions. And on the left side, we have the organization or the, um, the group that needs this permission. So it doesn't need to be an org uh, uh, as an organization group. It could also be like a, a cross organization or it could be a role or it could be a resource. It, do, it really doesn't matter. So 
what you need to decide upon is the permission. Is it going to be, for example, an illegible permission or is it going to be an active permission and so on? These are some of the things that you have to decide on your own. <clears throat> and again, as you can see here, you're delegating uh, permissions uh, into the structure. And that means that, for example, a de de developer who has access to four different projects, but he's currently just working on one project at the time. That means that when he starts working in the morning, he's just activating his prim uh, permission for that particular project. And that gives him access maybe for eight hours. And then uh, he does not have access to the three other projects in the which he actually has access to. He only activates what he needs. So again, just enough, just in time. Uh, we don't delegate permanent permission uh, where he has access to all four projects all day um, if he doesn't need it. So we want to limit that down. This is another example. On the right side here, this is a Power BI. And you will see, you will actually see that you need to have a slide for every single workload in your cloud infrastructure where you sit down with the owners of this, um, this workload within the environment and, and understand how are we delegating permissions to our Power BI environment in this case, or it could be Intune, or it could be an exchange or SharePoint or whatever it is. In this case here, this is the master data. And as you can see here, we have in our environment here, we have five different levels. We have the fabric administrator, which is the tenant role. We have the org level, which is a Power BI RBAC, which is a level two uh, permission. We have a data set administrator. We have the user uh, standard roles, build, read, share, and we have user custom roles. So again, we have on the right side, we have the, um, the different groups that has been delegated permission within the Power BI master data RBAC structure. On the left side, we have who gets what permission and is it an active permission? Typically, when it's a user that, is, that needs access, um, quite often, to be honest, I would give them active assignments so that they are having the permissions in the morning but once they need permissions higher up in the structure, uh, for example, this particular user here, he needs also to be a data set admin. Maybe he needs to do some changes up here. Then it's an eligible permission because that forces him to activate the permission and then he will get access to this uh, permission. So if it's less, uh, you know, in, intrusive uh, when it comes to permission, then it typically it's an active, and once it becomes more higher privilege, it, it's uh, obvious to, to do it in an electable way. And this is another example where it is Power BI business unit data, where you can see we have four levels. We have the, the tenant role, we have the org, the workspace admins, or the user workspace contributor. Again, the same way of delegating permissions. <clears throat> Lastly here, this is our DevOps environment, where we have the Azure DevOps administrator, we have the collection administrator, project administrator, teams administrator, and teams contributors. Again, we have the permission and we have the groups and we do the eligible or active assignments, uh, depending on the level of security we want to enforce. All right. So this, that covers the principles that I wanted to touch on. Now I want to move uh, and to show some extra add-ons that I have been working on. And um, so um, I'm not going to show you how to do an, a PIM. Uh, time does not permit to do that. Um, I hope everyone knows how to activate a PIM session. Otherwise, uh, download the slides and you're going to see a demo of how to do a PIM assignment. Um, <clears throat> but uh, if you have been working with PIM, it, you will also know that this is kind of a struggle sometimes because there's a lot of clicking around. So, and uh, that is why I have built these add-ons here, uh, as you can see. So what you're going to see now is 
how can I automate PIM assignments? And how can we uh, do uh, assignment using a wizard? How can we revoke assignments? How can we export which uh, assignments are out there? And lastly, the PIM for AV. <clears throat> I have not published this uh, yet for the community because right now <clears throat> I'm struggling uh, a little bit with the permissions. And it's actually due to the fact that inside Azure Resource Graph, <clears throat> which is a separate service, which is, think of it as an index, which contains an index of a state of a property. I can ask who has what permission on what uh, resource, and I can do that for active permissions. So that is uh, something that was added recently inside Azure Resource Graph. But currently, there is no support to show who has what illegible permissions. So illegible permissions are stored elsewhere. So you can actually not go into the traditional RBAC and see the, the legible permissions. So I'm working with the product team in Seattle, and this is a picture of me having a meeting with the, the, the ARM team and the resource graph team uh, recently in, in, uh, in, in mid-November, where we are working on different things so that we can get all these data into Azure Resource Graph. And once that is there, I will publish everything that you're going to see here uh, for moving forward. If you can't wait, send me an email, and I'll provide my email down on the bottom, and I'll be happy to, uh, to uh, start work with you guys if you want to play around with this uh, as well. <clears throat> so this is an example of how you can do the management. And again, uh, pick your choice. Uh, this is just the PowerShell way of doing it. Or you can, uh, if you have uh, Terraform or ISAP or whatever you, you choose, uh, pick your choice. Uh, the, the, the things that you need to deal with are the same things, like we need to assign um, administrative units. We need to uh, assign uh, you know, role delegations. Um, Azure resource delegations and stuff like that. So all these things here, think of them as kind of a desired state configuration where the business has defined some permission that needs to be delegated. So this is kind of the, the structured way of assigning permissions, whereas using an ad hoc method where we're going in and need to do a temporary assignment, we're going to touch that uh, later on. At the right corner, you'll see some examples of basic uh, data files. Um, I'm also supporting um, an SQL way to do this uh, so that we can, for example, use a service now that can manipulate a table uh, using SQL, and then uh, the script will run, and it will automatically enforce all the delegations that needs to be set up. So we can do this in various ways. This is how it will look like if you use my script and it will set up everything. One of the things at the bottom you can see here is actually setting up PIM policies. And that is actually something that I found was really strange. Why is it once I set up a PIM delegation, it's actually not as secure as, secure that I want it to be. So it doesn't enforce you know, things like enforcement on MFA. This is actually something today you have to configure yourself. So you actually need to go in and configure all these policies yourself or the settings for each of these delegations. So, so for example, for this global uh, role admin, global, uh, this role, and you have 102, each of them has a policy or a settings that needs to be configured. So you need to have some automations around that. <clears throat> But what you'll see very, very soon is that maybe it could be really cool to have a policy. So now, hopefully, you will see uh, that, and, and I'm going to test this uh, now, uh, uh, like policy settings uh, for PIM so that we can enforce these things, and, and you're going to see that uh, hopefully soon. Um, so this is a picture of the PIM program managers uh, inside uh, Redmond. So these are the guys that are you know, responsible for the whole design of the PIM infrastructure. 
This is uh, the first one that I wanted to show you, which is the, the assignment wizard. So the goal for this, uh, or the purpose for this is that, let's say that we have an admin that needs, to, or a developer that quickly needs some permission. And we don't have the time to go in and set it up uh, and create a ticket and, and wait for the automation to run. So we need to have a wizard, which will allow us on the left corner here, to go in and set up using a wizard. And this is an example of this wizard. You can see here that there are six steps and you're gonna see uh, how it works uh, right here. So again, you start it up, you decide what is it that I want to delegate? Is it a role, is it an Azure resource, a PIM for groups, whatever, whatever it is. And I go and I pick my choice. In this case, it's a role I want to delegate, and you're going to see all the different roles that in, in the environment, you go down, you pick the role. Um, so in this case here, it's the exchange administrator role. I choose, is it for a person or is it for a group of users? And in this case, I chose a person, and it comes up with all the admins in my environment. And I go down, and I can do either multi-select or select a single admin. And then I choose the length. In this case, I've just defined two, a legible or an active, and then it will do the assignment. So this is a simple way uh, where you're not clicking around a lot of things. You can have this a, as a shortcut on your, on your computer, and it will come up, and it will work, and it will uh, help you. Now I'm going to show an example of delegation of Azure resources, and it will automatically enumerate all the management groups, all the subscriptions. I'm going down, picking my management group. Is it for an admin? Is it for a group of users? I'm picking um, a user or an admin, and then I have the 427 different roles that are in within my environment. What permission is it that I want to, to delegate? And I go down, say I'm an API management eligible or an active assignments, and you get the picture. So this is kind of just helping you guys to do easier, faster, and without you know a, a lot of clicking around. Hopefully, this can help some of you guys out there. Once you have done this, a lot of times there are people in the organization that would like to know who has what permissions. And that's another thing that I have been talking with a with a product team around. I would love to have better um, overview of all the permissions. And this is an example of a script that I have built where I have uh, exported all the permissions uh, out to a spreadsheet and I can do pivot tables and I can, uh, you know, um, show the different dimensions in the data here, and I can see the, the permissions that have been delegated. So <clears throat> um, once you have built the overview of who needs what and also what needs to be revoked, then we also need to have an easy way to revoke all these assignments. And that's the purpose of this assignment revoker. On the left side, you'll see what is it that you want to revoke? Is it a role? Is it an Azure resource? Is it PIM for groups? On the step one is you'll see the different assignments that you want to re revoke. Again, um, you probably get the picture here. We choose what is it that we want to revoke. And in this case, it's a roles and it enumerates all the different roles uh, assignment that are out there. Is it like eligible permissions? I can do searching, I can do you know, multi-select, and I can say I want to remove all uh, delegations for a specific user. Um, and, and if I go in and I click and I click OK, it has revoked that permission. So again, this is just a sample, uh, easy way. It's a PowerShell script. It's all built using Microsoft Graph. It's open you'll get the source code so you can play around with this uh, if you feel that it makes uh, sense for you guys. <clears throat> this is for Azure resources where you can go in and you can revoke permissions uh, using this. You can do searching, multi-select and, and, and everything. So this is how it works. All right, so the last topic I wanna touch on is PIM for AD that I uh, wanted to show you. 
So what I have done here is um, I, it's using the existing infrastructure. So on the right side, you have enter ID where I have an, an account. And inside my AD, I have an account. And there is no sync in either way. So there is no write back, there are no groups and, and that are being synced, no OUs uh, that, that are, you know, everything is excluded. And if you under here, under, what you see here is that um, when you have a group that ends with uh, underscore AD, then that particular group is also created inside AD. Uh, with an identical name. So it is two groups, same name, but it's just in two different directories. And once, uh, then I have a script that reads all the PIM session, who is in what particular group and what is the time to live for that group. And then I'm in, 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 you know, identifying. So if the session is kicked off with this user, then I'm identifying the same account in AD, and I'm, then I'm just modifying the membership. So I'm adding and removing a user to this group. So it's very, very simple. There's no programming in this way. I'm just using standard ways of doing this. So what you'll see here is think of this as a script that runs in the background all the time, uh, where it detects uh, if new groups has been created, and then it goes in and, and checks the membership. This is an admin that are setting up a session. So now I'm kicking off a, a PIM session within my intro ID. I need to change DNS on all servers using a script, and I need that for eight hours. Then uh, my script will automatically detect this request and this membership. And now you can see here, it, it is adding the same user from inside my AD environment and making that user a member of the group for 300 minutes in this example here. And what, you, what I'm using here is a new parameter, which is available if the servers are, or the AD is running in 2016 forest functional mode, because that allows us to enable privileged access management feature. So it's a built-in feature in your environment which allow me to put an, a, a command here with a time to live, and then the user will add it, automatically be a member of the group for this uh, amount of minutes. And then the domain con controller will automatically remove the user once it hits that limit. So again, this is an example where it's looping through. It is checking the PIM session, how many seconds are available in the PIM session, how many seconds are inside my uh, AD session. And in this case, there's a deviation of 29 minutes, a second, 29 seconds, which is acceptable. So it, it is checking all the time. In this case here, you can see that the PIM session and the AD session is not on the same page. So it is adjusting the PIM, the, uh, the uh, membership time, the time to live, so it is syncing up the time. So now they are in sync. Um, so it is fully aligned with this. And it's just a PowerShell script. There's nothing uh, special here. It's uh, just going through. Once it either the, the time limit hits or the uh, user goes in and, and, uh, dis and, and stops the PIM session or the eight hours limit hits, um, then it automatically removes the user from this. And we don't need to have a forest level uh, row, mode uh, running. It will, if, if we don't have that feature, it's just simply adding and removing a user from a group. So it's not something very special. Here you will see that this particular AD user, he's just a domain user right now inside the AD. Sorry. Uh, and, uh, yeah. gonna, so there is a, you have three minutes left for the session. Just a time check. What? Sorry? Uh, you have three minutes left for the session. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's very good. So again, <clears throat> everything what you will see here is that it's a user that has, uh, it's an, an uh, admin account that are in here, and he doesn't have any permissions. And 
Um, and once we go into, uh, actually, I think I'll just uh, skip this demo and then you can uh, see it for yourself in the presentation because it will take a little time. But basically, you get the picture now. So if I go to uh, and uh, connect to a server uh, right now, I don't have permission for it. Then I'm activating the session inside ID. Then I'm getting the permissions uh, because of the group membership and I can connect to the server. So it, it works, uh, how it, this is how it works. And so it's very cool. And my customers really love this because it allows them to have PIM for AD using the same PIM uh, platform as you have here. Lastly, I want to just touch on one more thing, which is access review features. So if you have delegated a lot of permissions for your admins, Microsoft actually monitors who activates what commission, and you can set up access reviews, which allows you to get reports saying, we recommend that you remove this permission because he has never activated that permission. So you can actually also use access reviews internally in your environment. Just to keep in mind here, there are some things here uh, where you have uh, some limitations, like max role assignment groups per tenant of 500, nesting, uh, length, um, keep that in mind. Make sure to have owners of your PIM group so you can use it for access uh, reviews um, and keep separate admin accounts, no syncing. So, and remember the emergency accounts uh, to, to have that in place as well. So lastly, that's the last slide here. This is uh, me at the bottom, a link for my LinkedIn. At the top is a link for my blog. So I would like to thank you guys for being with me today. And it's been in a pleasure. And I hope you enjoyed the session here. And feel free to reach out if you have any questions at all. Thank you so much, um, Martin, for the, for the session. Uh, there is two questions uh, on the chat box. So one question, uh, it's possible to add the QR code to, to download the PPT. That is first question. Let me just uh, see the question here. Uh, yeah, so the PowerShell looks very useful here. Yeah, uh, I think uh, please send me an email um, and I'll just uh, put down my email address here uh, or uh, in here. So just uh, send me or write me uh, then we can work together uh, on this uh, for this. No worries. That, that's really, really good. And the other question was. Like uh, it is like to show the QR code so they can download the, the presentation as well. Yeah, yeah, perfect. I will just show the presentation QR code here, which is in the beginning here. We go. So do you see the QR code here? 